today's young people are probably the most resourceful and the most potentially the most consequential generation in, in human history. The younger you become, uh, the more resources and opportunities you have. And that's why I said that this is potentially the most consequential generation in human history. Now, uh, I'm standing here in, at the Australian Embassy, and you know Australia has always had a special place uh, in, in my personal life and also in my uh, professional career. Uh, there, there are several points uh, that you should know, but Australia, although you all are alumni, uh, Indonesian alumni of Australia, but some of these points you may miss and it's important uh, for you to understand and for Indonesians to understand. Uh, the first one is that, you know, I don't know if you realize that, but Australia is the closest physically Western country to us. You know, we think about Western country, we think about United States or United Kingdom, Germany, you know, France, Italy, and so on. But, you know, Perth is only three hours uh, plane drive. You know, uh, yesterday it took me three hours actually to go from Menteng to my house through Kuningan, right? <laughs> right? So it's really physically close uh, uh, to us. And, and uh, I think it's very important because, you know, our nationalism uh, has always uh, been related to uh, our relationship with Western nations. Right, uh, and I'll get, I'll get back into that. But it's very important to us for us to know that the closest Western country to Indonesia is Australia. And the second thing is this: you know, the countries that understand Indonesia the most among the Western nations, it is Australia. That I know for sure because this is where I work in the industry of diplomacy. Right? Uh, Americans have great diplomats. British have great diplomats. But Australia, by necessity, they have to understand, they have to know Indonesia. They have to get along with Indonesia. And, and third, now this is very important because a lot of Indonesians miss this. You know, I'm 52 years old and much of my life, I was informed and actually partly believe in, in the past that Western nations are out to get Indonesia. Right? This is the narrative in the 60s, in the 50s, even in the 70s and 80s, that the Western nations don't want Indonesia to become strong, and they want to make Indonesia weak because that way they can control the region and the world and blah, 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 blah. This was the real narrative that people actually believe. Uh, when I got into government, this is what I was told, and this is what I believe, and became you know, part of my uh, angles in looking at, at the world. But you know what? I don't know if it's true or not. You know, probably in the 60s it was true, right? Because we had a lot of regional rebellions that were supported by uh, some Western countries, right? But what I know now for sure is this. It is now the strategic interest of Western nations and of ASEAN countries, Southeast Asia and Asia, that Indonesia is united, not divided, right? and prosperous and stable because they see what's happening in the Middle East. They see what's happening in the Balkans, right? When that core country breaks apart, the whole world, the whole region is torn into turbulence, right? Jadi, what I realized when I became you know, ambassador to Washington, even way before when I was spokesman to the President Yudo you know, there is clear strategic interest in Australia to see Indonesia united, stable, democratic, yeah, and prosperous, right? It's not by way of idealism, really. It's in their strategic interest, right? Because if their next door neighbor catches fire, you know, everybody will, uh, will, will feel the impact of it, right? And I say this because this is not well appreciated. You know, some, the, the, the language and the narrative of the past still informs how some of us see the world today, right? And I think this is one of the most important uh, strategic postulate for us to understand. And take my work for this, uh, you know, coming from a former diplomat. In the next decade or so, there's going to be greater strategic realignment between Indonesia and Australia. You know, not just because we like each other, not because there's a lot of interchange, but from Jakarta's viewpoint, the things that we want to achieve with the region and the world 
and from Canberra's viewpoint, the things that they want to achieve with the region and the world are going to be increasingly convergent, right? And that will pull Jakarta and Canberra closer together. So you're going to see strategic re realignment based on real interests. And this is something that you've never seen in the 60s or 70s uh, before, right? And it's going to be very interesting. Now, my last part of uh, my, my, my remarks today is about, you know, what, what can you do? Uh, you know, what, what, what can you do uh, in, as, as people who are engaged in the relationship between Indonesia and Australia? Uh, a couple of things, and I think this is very important for you to know. Uh, first is this, and I'm speaking about Indonesians, not the Australians. Look, you got to stop being defensive about our nationalism. Right, you know, I grew up being defensive, but my nationalism. We, I felt always somebody is trying to get us. You know, there's a siege mentality, mental de kepung, yeah, uh, that I entertained through my, throughout much of my young and adult life. But you know, nations who are defensive about their identity and their nationalism are usually smaller than what they can be. You know. Big and great nations are usually comfortable, confident, and they feel secure about their national identity, right? So my first point is don't be as defensive about your nationalism as my generation had been. Secondly, I think it's very important for, for you to be forward-looking. Now, I say this because, again, I refer to my generation. My generation had been less forward-looking. You know, we were always told about things in the past, the glories in the past, that we, are often, we often forget to look what is in front of us and so, to adapt and seize opportunities. You know, in, in my generation, the word stability was used excessively, and it was used you know, as a way to maintain the status quo, rather than as a platform for change, for progressive mindset. So it's very important, in my view, for you to be forward-looking in whatever you do. Is it politics, business, economics? The greatest paradox for Indonesians is that we crave change, but when it's right in front of us, you know, we take a step back and say, I don't know if we were ready for that. Right? Uh, it happens a lot, you know, take two steps forward, one step backward. But uh, my, my view is if you see countries around the world who do well, they're usually driven by young people who are uh, opportunity driven. Uh, the next one I would say is uh, smart nationalism, right? Uh, you know, I, I use the term uh, nationalism ungul, right? Uh, I know we're all nationalistic. And you see the rise of nationalism in many parts of the world now, including in the Western world. And some of this are growing into restless nationalism. Some of it is growing into exclusive nationalism. Some of it is growing into narrow nationalism, right? Uh, I think it's very important for Indonesia to maintain our brand of nationalism, which is an open, moderate, pluralistic, uh, uh, and democratic nationalism. You know, this is what Indonesia is all about. Uh, at a time when many parts of the world are changing, as I said, people are becoming more close and more restless. Uh, I think it's even more important for Indonesia to maintain our brand of nationalism. Uh, so smart nationalism, uh, you know, a smart way of not just looking at yourself, but a smart way of knowing where we fit in the global scheme of things. That is going to be the key challenge for our generation. Uh, next, I would say, is the importance of diaspora. And I say this because I'm the chairman of the Indonesian uh, diaspora globally. But the, the diaspora is uh, something that Ambassador uh, Paul also reminded me, uh, that there are a lot of Indonesians in Australia, and of course worldwide, uh, that have become Australian citizens or they have become residents of Australia, and they do amazing things. You know, Iwan Sunito, for example, is a property tycoon. 
uh, in Sydney. Uh, his brother, Nissin Sunito, uh, supposedly owned a ranch uh, the size of Bali, someplace in the, in the uh, north uh, western Australia. Whenever I go to Australia, I meet amazing Indonesians. These are professionals, uh, uh, you know, people of skill and knowledge and connections that I think uh, should... Uh, you know, be more of the engine of our uh, re relationships. Um, and the, other th the last two things I want to talk about is uh, this. Uh, look, you know, Indonesia-Australia relations is very unique because we're very close, but there's always something going on, you know. Uh, there's always an issue here and there. But what I notice is that when these things happen, uh, not many people come up and defend the relationship. You know, they may have an opinion, oh, it shouldn't be like this, it should be like that. But maybe it's in our shy culture. We, don't, we hardly defend the relationship the way it should be defended, you know. Um, and I think this is true on both sides, yeah. Uh, and my, my advice to you, look, if, if you are invested in this relationship, uh, and, you know, if you know what Australia is all about, and if the Australians know what Indonesia is all about, and you see the relationship being attacked, I would suggest, you know, say something. Say something in your Facebook, tweet about it. You know, if you are somebody famous, go to media and, and defend the relationship. But I don't see much of that uh, uh, so far. Uh, and I think it's very important. Uh, the last point is this. Uh, look, I, if you ask me what is the most important thing to maintain uh, as a young people, uh, you know, I was at 30, 20, 30 years ago, uh, your, your age, you know, I would say it's idealism, right? Uh, and, you know, it's, it's, if it's hard to be an idealist your whole life. My idealism has been challenged all throughout my life, right? Uh, I used to say, for every 10 idealists who get into the workplace, who get into government and politics, I think only two or three get to maintain their idealism uh, at the end, right? Uh, I think I'm, I, I'm right in saying that since we're up in Dini, you know, I have early retirement, and one of the proudest things, uh, the best things that I can be proud of is that from day one I'm in government until the last day I'm in government, I maintain that sense of idealism. You know, the belief that the world can be and should be better. And this is what got me up in the morning, right? And this is what got me up. You know, I was once paid only $50 a month. I had a PhD from London School of Economics, right? But I didn't mind it because it's my idealism. And as I look back in my life, uh, I believe that the best weapon, the best engine, uh, the best drive that young people can have in their life as they excel towards greater heights is not just the sense of nationalism, as I told you, but also the belief that the idealism deserves a better place in the world. Thank you very much.